Bro, Harris crushed it. The thing about crowd sizes, oh my God, how she made him shake hands at the beginning. What? What are you talking about? That was vintage Trump, man. He dismantled her. Wait, which is it? Well, it was both of these and neither of these. Today, we're gonna do a complete review of the Harris-Trump debate. Tell you what they said, what they actually meant when they said it, what was missing, and why the whole thing was utterly meaningless. UNFTR. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter who you think won the debate. The point is that we finally have a clear understanding of what each administration would look like. I mean, finely tuned policy prescriptions, clearly articulated foreign and domestic policies, and thoughtful and easy to comprehend economic programs. No sillies. That's not what we saw. That's not even what last night's debate was about. It was to see if the Democrats had a candidate who would show up in something other than pajamas and whether Donald Trump could contain himself under criticism. So on that, the answers are yes and no. Kamala Harris did her job by proving that she is indeed a youthful, competent, energetic woman of color. And no, she didn't just decide to be a woman of color. Trump started off hurling his usual insults and gish gallop non sequiturs but he did take the bait when it came to crowd sizes and proceeded to go fully mask off. In the end, I'm not sure who, if anyone, was swayed by these performances, but that's actually our word of the day. Performance, an act of staging or presenting a play, concert, or other form of entertainment. And what a performance it was by everyone, not just the candidates, but the moderators as well. Bravo and brava. This is about how low the bar is for debate moderation these days and our expectations from presidential candidates. The responses to the world's most mediocre and, with one exception, irrelevant questions were remarkable for how similar they were. Not in style, but in substance. If you're just judging their performances, then the reactions to the debate, I guess, made some sense. News organizations on the left and on the right went out of their way to praise Harris and portray last night's debate as a definitive victory for her campaign. Trump offered the same old, same old. He was unhinged. Harris was a breath of fresh, confident air. They gave starkly different visions of the next four years based on... Based on what? Seriously. I mean, apart from the antics and moments like these. They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating... They're eating the pets. I know a lot of my friends that bleed blue are going to hate this. But the debate was confirmation that the two major parties are indistinguishable from one another on everything but abortion rights. And the corporate media is incapable of asking questions and follow-ups that offer any insight into things that matter. How can you say that? Trump's a monster. He's a felon. He literally tried to overthrow our democracy. All true. But if you were looking to the debate to, I don't know, determine how things would be different under a Trump or a Harris administration, there's no difference outside of optics and ickiness. And I'm talking again only about the debate here, folks. The only exception, again, in terms of the questions posed and the answers given in the debate, is where the candidates land on reproductive rights. When the abortion issue was raised, Harris was at her absolute best and Trump gave a word salad about states' rights. So specifically, Trump would maintain the status quo and allow the states to determine abortion access. He hasn't said, though I'm sure we can guess, what he would do if a bill somehow made it to his desk to codify a federal abortion ban into law. Harris, meanwhile, maintains that she would codify the provisions under Roe v. Wade into a federal law if a bill came across her desk. Here's the difference, though, and I'm sorry to say, Trump was exactly right that no such bill can even make it this far unless one party gains the majority in both houses and the Senate moves to kill the filibuster. It's highly unlikely that we're going to see super majorities in either house anytime soon. And that means two things. A bill for either side can't make it into law unless the filibuster is killed, and that also presumes a majority, right? And two, there's no way of constitutionally securing either abortion access or an abortion ban because we may never see those kinds of majorities again in our lifetime. So alternately, there's the Supreme Court route, which is how we arrived in this mess in the first place. A challenge to the existing law could theoretically move all the way to the Supreme Court again over the next couple of decades, but given the current composition of the court, it means that a challenge to their own ruling is not only unlikely to succeed, 
it wouldn't even be heard. So let's be clear that on reproductive rights, we are fucked. So the takeaway from this debate as it relates to issues is at least you have one side that's continuing to fight for abortion access and another side that will do anything to end it completely. But both will take a tremendous amount of time. So if you're a single issue voter, the answer is clear. Either way, you're in it for the long haul. As for the balance of the debate, let's look at the questions first. Then we'll run through how terrifying the responses were if you're into things like, I don't know, feeding your family, human and civil rights, reducing inequality, and preventing genocides and massacres. And then we'll conclude with what was omitted by the corporate shills behind the moderator desk. So if we take abortion access off the table, I've boiled the questions down in a nutshell. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Can Americans afford higher prices due to tariffs? How will you stop border crossings moving forward? VP Harris, are you for or against fracking? President Trump, did you win or lose the last election? What will you, VP Harris, do differently in Gaza? President Trump, how would you stop the war in Ukraine? VP Harris, do you bear responsibility for how we withdrew from Afghanistan? President Trump, is it appropriate to talk about your opponent's racial identity? President Trump, have you come up with a replacement for Obamacare yet? What's the plan for climate change, y'all? Now, I watched the debate live without taking any notes so that I wasn't distracted. And then I read the transcript again. And by the way, reading Trump transcripts might be my favorite thing. Scratch that. Watching Sarah Cooper on TikTok lip syncing Trump quotes is actually the best thing ever. The boat is sinking, water goes over the battery, the boat is sinking. Do I stay on top of the boat and get electrocuted? Or do I jump over by the shark and not get electrocuted? Because I will tell you, he didn't know the answer. He said, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question. Anyway, reading the transcript allows you to really scour their responses for actual answers to try and find out where they stand on the issues. Now, if you trust that I did a competent job, I'm going to just boil it all down for you. Harris did not answer the question, but she did give two of the only three tangible things that she would do as president if elected. She would give startup businesses a $50,000 tax deduction and expand the child tax credit to $6,000 up from $2,000 where it's scheduled to be for 2025. Trump then rambled about the tariffs he put in place, how inflation is either 21% or 80%, and how immigrants are ruining the country. Harris responded with COVID unemployment, January 6th, and Project 2025. Trump then said he did the pandemic good. And Harris responded by saying how Goldman Sachs, the Wharton School of Business, and Nobel laureates all think she's more qualified because, you know, that's how you connect with the working class. Then Trump showed her the level of his intellect by saying that her plan is run, spot, run. Actually, we might be down here now. So Trump basically responded with, tariffs good, Biden bad, bacon expensive. And when the moderators just glossed over Trump avoiding the question, they did rightly point out to VP Harris that the Biden-Harris administration kept Trump's tariffs in place, to which Harris said, Trump sold our chips to China and thanked President Xi for handling COVID. Then he called her and her dad Marxists and said he'll buy her a MAGA hat. Oh, and that she let more migrants into the country than there are people in the state of New York. And apparently that was enough for the moderators who then turned to abortion, which we've already discussed. That took up probably the biggest chunk of time, after which the moderators effortlessly turned to the issue of border crossings and migration policy. So Harris started off by touting her prosecutorial background, which is just, again, another great way to connect with the people, and then said, well, they had a plan, but Trump called everyone and said, don't do it. But then she remembered the big zinger that they rehearsed prior to the debate and said, Trump's rallies are boring. Predictably, he took the bait and launched into how his rallies are great, hers are bad, he's great, and America can also be great again, and also immigrants are eating people's pets. Well, as you might expect... All hell broke loose for a minute, and then when the moderators regained control, Harris followed up with how she has endorsements from military figures and Republicans who worked with Mitt Romney and George Bush, and how both Dick and Liz Cheney endorsed her. So let's see, that makes Goldman Sachs, the Wharton School, warmongers, and the entire Cheney family so down to earth. W wait, what was the question again? Oh, right, immigration, right? Continue. Trump did get back on message at that point to say that he would indeed deport like 11 million immigrants, even though he thinks that the number's higher because they're either rapists, drug dealers, or criminals. 
Harris thought that was funny because Trump is actually a criminal, but that's okay because she's going to bring down the grocery prices and help small businesses. Uh, okay, we're still on immigration, right? We are. Anywho, Trump said that he's actually not a criminal and that the charges are all bogus and how he probably almost took a bullet to the head because of them. And those were all the ideas expressed on immigration. Right. Moving on then. The moderators pointed out that Harris used to be against fracking and now appears to really like it. And she confirmed that she does indeed support it and made sure specifically to tell the people of Pennsylvania that she supports it and that we need energy from all over the place. And that's good because she's a big fan of oil and of drilling because she wants more of it because she grew up in a middle class neighborhood, but Trump grew up rich. So she wants to build more houses and protect victims of sexual assault and seniors from getting scammed. OK, wait, are we still on immigration? Or are we on, I thought this was the fracking? Quite, I'm so confused. So then Trump said, my dad was a builder and she wants to defund the police and, quote, do transgender operations on illegal aliens, end quote. Also, she wants to take your guns and that he does oil better because she likes windmills, but so does he. He said he won. She said he lost. I can't fucking believe this was a question in the debate. He blamed Nancy Pelosi for January 6th, to which Harris responded that he's the leader of the Proud Boys. So he said, no, I'm not, because Laura Ingram and Sean Hannity said I'm not. Also, millions of immigrants are coming into the country, and Joe Biden sleeps till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Twelve and a half minutes of this. Twelve and a half minutes they spent on this, and I'm not making any of that up. Okay, here we go. Time to get on record. 90 seconds. She spent 90 seconds saying what I pretty much outlined the day before in our newsletter, by the way. October 7th, Israel has a right to defend itself. We're working around the clock to free the hostages. There's too many innocent Palestinians dying. Iran is a threat. Two-state solution. Now, Trump gave a more generous 113 seconds to say it wouldn't have happened if he was still there. Harris hates Israel and Arabs generally, and she gave Iran $300 billion. Now for the big follow-up. And let me read this so I have it right. Vice President Harris, he says, you hate Israel. That was the big follow-up. It's a strange follow-up to the question. And Harris, of course, said that she loves Israel, but that Trump loves Putin and Kim Jong-un. So he said... Putin endorsed her just last week and that she killed the Keystone Pipeline and helped Putin build the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And those were, and that was it. Those were the answers to the war in Gaza. Okay. All right. So this question led to what might have been Harris's biggest blunder. Trump goes down a familiar route of blaming NATO and saying how this never would have happened on his watch because the whole world is afraid of him. And this is where she blew it. She revealed that she met with President Zelensky just days before the invasion to warn him of it and then visited the allies in the region to let them know. And that if the Biden administration didn't requisition the funds to support Ukraine's defense, Putin would be, quote, sitting in Kiev right now. And that's when he pounced. I'm going to read this one again. So, quote, she's a horrible negotiator. They sent her in to negotiate. As soon as they left, Putin did the invasion, end quote. Not great. I should also mention that neither of them actually answered the question again. So here Harris regained the upper hand because she pointed out how dumb he promised to get us out of Afghanistan and didn't, and how the Biden-Harris administration did, and how his big idea was to invite the Taliban to Camp David, which is apparently the most offensive thing about our time in Afghanistan. Anyway, so then Trump said arguably the most fucking gangster thing in a debate since Ted Cruz promised to make the sand in the Middle East glow. Again, let me just quote this psychopath. And I told Abdul, don't do it anymore. You do it anymore, you're going to have problems. And he said, why did you send me a picture of my house? And I said, you're going to have to figure that out, Abdul. So the moderators literally just moved on from this like they were witnesses to a mob killing and didn't want to talk to the cops. Quote, I don't care. I don't care what she is. Whatever she wants to be is fine with me. The funniest thing about this exchange is that Harris came back at Trump by talking about how his family excluded black people in New York from their leases. But it appeared that she couldn't find the word landlord. But we all know what she wanted to say. She just caught herself because you're not supposed to say it anymore. Slumlord.
Now, you're not going to believe this, but he hasn't, like at all. He did say he's been thinking a lot about it, though, and that he'll have something ready, and it's going to be great. Just you wait. Meanwhile, Harris talked extensively about this point and about the need to ultimately move to a single-payer system, preferably Medicare for all, because we're the only developed nation in the world without universal health care, and the private insurance system is driving up costs while contributing to worsening outcomes. Wait. Are you serious? Nah. She said that her and Tim Waltz are both gun owners and that they're not coming for your guns. I mean, she did come back to the question after she said this by praising John McCain for saving the Affordable Care Act and that they've reduced some of the costs of prescription drugs. And then Trump came back at her for the McCain thing, but the moderators cut him off to ask them both a super important question. Oh, shit. Right. We're cooking the planet. Well, Harris said that she's super proud of the trillion-dollar investment into clean energy because she's working with the unions to bring back manufacturing, so that's good. And Trump responded by saying they're building cars in Mexico, so tariffs. Both of these responses were good enough for the moderators, so they just cut to commercial and came back for closing statements. Wait, that was it? That's all they said about climate change? Yeah, that was it. In the closing statements, then, Harris reviewed her tax deductions for startups, the expanded child tax credit, and remembered to say that her plan also includes help with the down payment of $25,000 for first-time homebuyers. Now, for what it's worth, I know I sound like a broken record here, tax credits are often missed because it's a posthumous event. It also relies on knowing how to fill out a tax return, and it only makes sense if your income is at a threshold high enough to feel the benefit of a credit. Direct payments make way more sense, and our experience with these payments during the pandemic gave us the proof we need that they actually lift people out of poverty. And a $25,000 credit for a first-time home is great, but how would that work? No one knows. Also, it does nothing to prevent homeowners from just raising prices, and it doesn't help out the 55% of Americans who rent because they don't qualify for a conventional mortgage. And the $50,000 tax credit for startup businesses? <sighs> Do you know how much cash flow this startup theoretically has to have for this to be meaningful? How many years is that good for, considering most startups lose money in the first three to five years? Does it mean that I get to put $50,000 against my bottom line income to reduce my income tax exposure? So if so, let's just say that my business makes $100,000 net income in the third year, but I have losses in the first two of more than that. I would have carry forward losses to put against that net income, so this really wouldn't benefit me until I work through those, right? So I can take it in what, year four? If so, and if I have the same net income of $100,000, then that means that only $50,000 at that point is taxable, right? And if the corporate tax rate is, let's say, 21%, right, then my tax liability in that fourth year would be $10,500 instead of $21,000. So this startup business plan would save me $10,500 in my fourth year of business, assuming I made it that far, which is unlikely because 90% of all startups fail within that time frame. Okay, okay, okay. Did Trump have a closing statement? Uh, yeah, he did. Sorry. Um... She's a liar. She's going to ban fracking like Germany did, and now Germany does it again because they realized it was a mistake and that world leaders love him the most, and she'll bring about World War III and that it will be nuclear. Okay, so the debate was only 90 minutes, right? There's only so much that they can get into that time frame. There's only so many questions they can ask, and obviously a lot's going to be left out. So what do you think they should have done, right? Well, for starters... Did we need to relitigate the stolen election conspiracy or revisit how we left Afghanistan? Probably not. Did we need to center the economic hardship among American families around whether or not tariffs work? And for the record, this administration didn't just maintain the Trump tariffs, they doubled down on them. Instead of talking about climate change and fossil fuel dependence, we needed to get on the record whether the candidates love fracking? Well, I've run through this list before as a thinking, feeling human being in the world who thinks about this stuff all day, every day, there were a few things missing. Things like how socialist style policies contributed to the economic recovery of the nation by supporting poor and working class families during the pandemic and why we've eliminated every single one of them since then. No serious talk or questions about the Inflation Reduction Act 
the American Rescue Plan, two of the most consequential pieces of legislation since the Great Society programs. No talk of widening inequality and the crushing consumer and household debt that the vast majority of Americans are experiencing. No path forward for citizenship for migrants living in this country or how to fix our broken immigration system outside of just closing the border and continuing to criminalize immigration. A diplomatic end to the war in Ukraine. Halting the sale of arms to Israel. Refinancing debt, student debt, at low or no interest rates. Direct payments instead of tax credits to poor families. Free public college. Funding for public schools. Breaking up big banks and big ag. Repealing Citizens United. Campaign finance reform. Full decriminalization of marijuana. Eliminating the Social Security contribution cap. Reclassifying broadband as a utility to guarantee high-speed internet access. Permanent union protections to bolster the efforts of the current NLRB. Eliminating the carried interest provision. Incentives for biodiversity and agriculture. Ending fossil fuel subsidies. Windfall taxes on corporate profiteers. Regulating the rollout of dangerous AI technology. Abolishing private prisons. Coordinated housing addiction and mental health funding. Reparations for indigenous nations. And a prohibition on stock trading for federal elected officials, to name a few. So outside of the questions that really should have been cut that we mentioned, we got questions on tariffs, fracking, stopping the flow of migrants, Obamacare, the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, and a perfunctory closing question on climate change. And here's the thing, in the minimal amount of space that the candidates gave to actually provide answers, and in the massive amount of evidence we have from both of their time in office, I can tell you that the answers are nearly identical. And that should scare the shit out of all of us. Both candidates are in favor of increasing tariffs, which only harms the American consumer. Both candidates expanded oil and gas drilling in the United States and are committing to do more. Both candidates have extreme border policies. Neither candidate has the answer for ending the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, and neither is contemplating cutting off military and financial support for Israel, for sure. Neither candidate has a plan to reduce the cost of health care or even contemplate a path towards universal health care or Medicare for all, and neither candidate has a meaningful plan to combat climate change outside of investing more in manufacturing. The only question for them is whether we create green manufacturing jobs or so-called traditional ones. Now, just because the debate was meaningless doesn't mean they all are. I mean, the last one changed the entire race when Biden came apart at the seams in front of our eyes. The debate between Carter and Reagan offered sharply different visions for America, even if we bought into the wrong one. The first televised debate between Kennedy and Nixon probably won Kennedy just enough support on optics alone to eke out the election. So sometimes they really do matter. This one, not so much. If you're a Harris supporter, you're pretty pumped up because she took it to him personally in a way that we all wish we could, and nobody's been able to really do so far, so kudos to her on that. And Trump just reminded everybody that he's a low-energy, low-IQ, mean-spirited xenophobe without an ideological care in the world. And he also looks like that pumpkin on your doorstep that you try picking up in early December because you left your Halloween decorations out for too long. Now, if you're a Trump supporter, you love the red meat and the anger he threw out there because you're mad too. And you seized on the fact that Harris touted support from elite institutions and figures as evidence that she's just another latte-sipping coastal elite. So as progressives, we key in on the things that weren't said and noticed just how aligned the parties are on the things that were said. Outside of abortion access, respect for democracy, tone, and the ability to form a coherent sentence, the parties are indistinguishable from one another. Mind you, any or all of these are good enough for me, even as a progressive, because there are literally no other options for this one job. It's what we got. My concern is more for the people that don't watch the debate, like the single parent, the unemployed worker, the low-wage laborer, student, the gig economy participant, the family working multiple jobs to barely afford rent and food, the homeless child, unemployed worker on disability addicted to painkillers, the terrified immigrant who escaped uncertainty or far worse, the middle-class worker without a pension who can barely afford health insurance coverage, the retiree working part-time as a Walmart greeter because Social Security just isn't enough to cover living expenses. In other words, America. That's who I'm concerned about. Because while the corporate media pats itself on the back for managing to contain the conversation and hit the commercial break mark, and the pundits trip over themselves to declare their side the winner, the real loser of this debate is America. Here endeth the lesson. 
Hey, if you made it this far, I'd really appreciate it if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel. And if you really dig what we do, we have a free weekly newsletter that you can sign up for. Just go to unftr.com and sign up today. While you're there, you can look at all of our essays and articles from the past, archived episodes of the podcast. You can browse our directory of progressive resources. There's a ton of great information and material for progressives on this website. So go to unftr.com. And thanks for watching the video.